Why is it important to understand religious tradition and sexual violence and find a better way? I'm here with Samira Qureshi from heartwomenandgirls.org and I'm Kathy Bartuli from theintimacydojo.com. And Samira, you'll be talking at the Woodhull Sexual Freedom Summit uh, in almost a month on religious tradition and sexual violence, moving from a framework of oppression to one of empowerment. And could you tell us why that topic is important to you and why you decided to share it, to share that there? Sure. Um, I'm sure it seems like a very unique title for a workshop. Well, it's very intriguing. I'm like, tell me more. <laughs> so, Heart, we've been around for about eight years, and uh, we have three staff. And during our own journeys of doing this work with Muslim women and with Muslim communities, we found that faith, sexual health, and health can't be separated out. And that's the same for a lot of, I think, faith traditions, um, whether you're a Catholic, Buddhist, Jewish, or Muslim, or any other faith. Um, when you practice from a religious-based perspective, health and sexual health is intertwined with that. Mm -hmm. And then, as we've noticed with political climates and the media, especially around Muslim and those who are being othered, yes. um, there's a great deal of misunderstanding, oppression, and biases that a lot of non-Muslim folks have towards Muslims. So it puts a lot of extra strain on already minority communities who are trying to access sexual health and sexual violence services. Uh, it is so, so hard reason, to begin with. It's like yeah. there's so much shame and, and then add that on top, it seems impossible. Right, right. And so we've noticed doing the work that if um, professionals are coming from a religiously and culturally informed perspective, um, they're met much more easier from the Muslim community with regards to building trust and really understanding the intersections that come into play with sexual violence, including religion, which is one of them, and hate crimes, for example, and Islamophobia. There's a lot of intersections that come with seeking sexual health information yeah. and resources. Well, there, there is so much Islamophobia. Like, even people that I've always seen as very open and curious Mm -hmm. uh, people I've been close to my entire life, uh, they come out with, set, like, I'm like, what? Like, very fearful, and, and I think that's, it, it, I think there's probably 1% of every religion and culture is a little bit, is extreme, mm -hmm. and the rest yeah. of us are all just trying to get by and figure out how to, you know, do our, do our best, and when we, other people like that, it's so hard. Um, could you give us an example of a religious tradition that, uh, from the Muslims that you'd have that you would be incorporated, important to incorporate as you're educating? Yeah, I think the biggest one, Kathy, is to see Islam as being sex positive. Yeah. And I would say a lot of um, folks who don't understand Islam would say the opposite, that it's sexually oppressive. Right. Especially with regards to women, girls, and expressing sexuality. There's a lot of misunderstanding about modesty, sexual purity, and understanding the faith. But as you dig deeper into Islam and look at the holy book and the teachings, it's incredibly sex positive. Mm -hmm. So during a lot of workshops, we'll bring up texts and verses from the Quran that really explain what it means to be um, a sexual being from a religious perspective. So that's the part where I think practitioners find really fascinating mm -hmm. is that um, when you listen to Muslims talk about sexuality and religion, then you'll get the real picture yeah. um, in an empowering way instead of from the outside when it's myth-ridden and um, incorrect most of the time. Well, yeah, I think a lot of, especially Western cultures, we've seen some movies maybe that were probably not very accurate written by Westerners and just perpetuating, like you said, myths about how people mm -hmm. interact. Um, and are you using this, um, like, I love that, you know, reducing sexual violence is so important in educating people. Um, how, are you how are you using this? It, it, you have your website, you, you work with women and, and girls and help them with that? Yeah, so we um, take a developmental approach. So we have curriculum and programs from kids ranging all the way up to older adults, married mm -hmm. couples. Yeah. And so we call ourselves religiously and culturally informed. Mm -hmm. And um, we also don't solely work with women and girls. That was how we kind of came about initially doing sex ed work. Yeah. But as you know, with sex education comes sexual violence disclosures. Yeah. And really to get to the root of sexual violence, you have to do prevention with those who could perpetrate, which are mostly men and boys. Yeah. And so we're shifting our work um, to do more comprehensive sex ed 
and I'm using gender binaries very aware, but across all folks of different developmental stages. Um, so we will teach kids about their bodies at age five or six and give them um, parents religious reason why, for example, um, all the way up to puberty and adolescence, and then those who are preparing to be intimate at whatever stage they decide to do that. Um, we kind of take religion and bring it to a developmental practical level. I love that, that's beautiful. I, I see, I remember myself, like outside of religious or culture, but like, I remember being very curious and also very confused and shamed because I had a, a sexual abuse history, but like wanting to know more, but there was no access to it. There was no place, there was lots of gossip and you know, we were sh seventh grade girls whispering to each other and sharing a lot of misinformation. So sharing, letting people understand their own bodies is just very empowering and it lets them feel more secure in themselves. Absolutely. And being able to get it from, like you said, the accurate source and um, being able to see women and also boys just feel empowered when they get in the information. Um, I, I almost feel like they're given more agency. Um, they get more um, empowerment to be able to go out and even talk to health practitioners about their bodies, let alone their families and their potential partners. So yeah. it's it's incredibly empowering from the self first and then shared with other individuals. Yeah, that's wonderful. When, when did you start this program? So HEART was founded in 20, not 20, um, 2009 or 2010 mm -hmm. in, in Chicago. Nadia Mahajir is the founder. Mm -hmm and the executive director. Um, I joined a few years after that, but she was working with the city of Chicago within the public health field and realized that there was a lack of information for Muslim women and girls mm -hmm. and actually created a project out of that through her work. And the reception was so great that it kind of led her to form this nonprofit. Um, so it started as a volunteer run organization in Chicago eight years ago. And now we are a national um, team with three full-time staff and about 30 trainers across the country. Oh, that's wonderful. And I'm, yeah, so it's it's what we call a labor of love, which I think this work can be, mm -hmm. um, as I'm sure you can relate. Yeah. And so we've been really blessed with opportunities and more funding, and now we're able to spread our work a lot more. Oh, that's I, I love it. And actually, I think that a lot of times, because we're all, it's, it's so hard, a lot of people are fighting just for not to not do abstinence only education, like we're fighting just to get education out there, but I haven't heard a lot of discussion around making it culturally or religiously um, lined up or aligned. And I think that's really powerful because there's, again, so much shame and, and fear around this kind of work and this kind of discussion. And then if you can make it so that it matches what people believe and their, their belief system, their culture, that's gonna make it easier for them to hear you. Versus mm -hmm. like, not only do I have to deal with the shame of talking about this, but I have to translate it through different cultural uh, perspectives. Right, right. It's, all, it's like there's more barriers to cross when you yeah. don't have those little tools and practical skills to do that. And so that's what we're hoping we'll be able to share at the summit. That's wonderful, I can't wait to hear your talk. That sounds so powerful. Um, when, can you give us an example? I know you, I don't want to have you violate anybody's confidentiality, but can you give me an example of um, some t a time someone came in and really was touched by the way you're teaching this? Yeah, I, it's interesting how when we do in-person workshops and trainings, we'll always get um, anonymous comments on evaluation mm -hmm. surveys or we'll get social media reach outs as well. And so recently, I believe we had someone reach out and it was featured in a, a recent NPR article on our work, but he's a survivor of sexual abuse from within the, with his family and has kind of kept it within himself for many years, attended a workshop by the staff member in Los Angeles and found a comfort and reached out and, and then just said like, didn't realize that this space existed, didn't realize that there was an organization being able to create safe spaces not only to be heard but to potentially connect with resources and from a spiritual perspective too as you can imagine um, I've read that sexual abuse is um, a lot like soul murder in some cases when it's a religious um, when, the, when there's a religious affiliation right so being able to have someone there for you to hold space yeah. and to be able to understand that and not judge for any 
you know, questioning you have or a disenchantment with the faith tradition, I think is really powerful. Yeah. Um, and so that's one powerful example of, of what we've heard um, folks who've attended say about our work. Oh, wow. That's, yeah. I, mine wasn't, my abuse wasn't religiously based, but I can understand. I did have confusion because I was told if I was a good girl, I went to, um, I guess, Protestant, I don't know, whatever they took me to. But they were telling us if we were good, bad things wouldn't happen if we prayed and all that. And I remember praying and thinking, I'm trying to be good. I don't understand why this is still happening. But if it's also with, within the context of a religious, uh, like, like, Connect, there's a connection there that would be even more confusing like how do I hold that so I love that you were able to give that person some some sense of safety and understanding absolutely and hopefully um, more individuals like that are able to reach out even virtually um, that happens sometimes too um, not necessarily in person have you found that there your, your title is religious tradition and sexual violence if you found that if you does teaching within that context of their religious tradition does that reduce sexual violence does that help people like you know you said it helps them understand faster but does it um have you found that that's had an impact on sexual violence or do you see that so that's a really good question and i think it would be hard to answer um so but how do you separate that out well, yeah, so knowing that the root of all sexual violence is power and control, I think some people, those who are perpetrators, are vastly unaware of how they misuse and abuse religion to gain so power and to keep control, right? So I think they're in need of more enlightenment than a workshop. Mm -hmm. I think they're in need of severe sorts of intervention and therapy that's beyond what we can um, really offer. Our work is more around the victim blaming that goes on within our community. So how people are misunderstanding what is religion when it's actually patriarchal garbage. <laughs> if I'm cool. Thank you. That's so amazing. So, you know, like, Islam has been misinterpreted and mistranslated by certain segments of the Middle East, and a lot of religious education comes from certain sects of that area. Yeah. And so passed down through many men, for example, it's, it's just led to more victim blaming and misconstruing modesty for um, basically giving permission um, that if a woman is not modest, that she's a victim or a potential victim of sexual violence. So we are completely debunking that. There's a lot of um, verses and religious texts that completely debunk that. So not so much the perpetrator side, but the victim blaming, right? So isolation from the community, mm -hmm. victims not knowing where to go. Yeah. Um, that's where we're seeing a large impact. Yeah. And we have a lot more female scholars coming out with literature about this. And it's and it's incredible to see that happening. Oh, that's, I'm so glad that's, and I think there's a certain amount of victim blaming uh, oppressors or uh, violators don't often want to see themselves as that, so it's a tendency to blame the blame the victim. But then, when it's right. if they start using religion to justify it, um, yeah, I re I remember reading the Quran. Uh, I guess it was a decade ago, and I know there's many nuances I didn't understand, but it was so beautiful, and I was like, this is not at all what I thought I'd under get from the book, right. um, from right. from the teachings in there. Right. It's, it's easy in any faith tradition to cut and paste, so-called, to make it um, justify your actions. Yes. And I think it can be done with any religion. Mm -hmm. But what I noticed with the Islamophobia you mentioned is more people do that with Islam than other faith traditions. And I think media has led to that oh, and absolutely. allowed that to happen. Yeah, there's a lot of fear, fear mongering. And yeah. I, I'm like, there's as many Christians that are doing horrible things, probably more than... Right a lot of other religions and yet we right. focus in on let's make them the bad guys so we don't have to actually right. deal with the issue right so wow i love that you're doing this work um why did you decide on woodhull as a place to present this yeah so we are constantly looking for innovative forums to share our work mm -hmm. and given that woodhull's mission is sexual freedom um, and the current landscape of the intersections of Islam and politics and gender violence, we thought, wow, like what a way to put a spin on the work we do by 
talking about it from a sexual freedom perspective mm -hmm. rather than having to always be defensive in our narrative, right? Mm -hmm. Always having to try and change people's mind by having to shut down Islamophobia, which we will in this presentation, but we're completely taking it from a sex positive framework which we find more empowering as well, yeah. and more positive given that, um, you know, a lot of sex ed, like you said, when it's done, it's so shameful, it's very fear-mongering, it's not empowered abstinence space, for example, it's yeah. shame-filled and fear-based, so um, we're excited for this forum because it lends to that positive tone, mm -hmm. and I think we're excited to learn from the forum as well, so we love connecting with other folks in the Field and kind of learning from them and making sure that our sex ed is very up-to-date and evidence-based as well. Yeah, it's a great, I, I go back, I've been going through this in my eighth year because it's just, it's a great place to recharge and network and find out yeah. the latest, because we're evolving, we're, our understanding is growing more nuanced and more powerful and just immersing yourself for a couple of days and people that are really diving into this work, it's, I always leave recharged and ready to go out there and do stuff. And that's exciting. And I think as practitioners, we all need that, yeah. that space to be in a bubble for a couple of days, yeah. stick it in, and then, okay, now let's get back to the real world and take what I, I learned and implement it, hopefully. Yeah. Um, this is, I'm so touched by what you're doing, and it's so beautiful. Um, is there anything you'd like to leave people with, a thought or, you know, to wrap up the interview? Like, for people that wanted to know more, is there a place they can go, or...? Yeah, so uh, we do have a pretty active social media presence, so heartwomenandgirls.org is our website. Uh -huh. um, we recently started doing more sex ed virtually using Instagram and Facebook, oh, nice. so you can find us there. Um, Instagram, we're heart to grow so we believe um, the heart is actually an acronym. A lot of people think uh, cardiac um, health, but yeah. it's health education, advocacy, research, and training. Oh, nice. So those, yeah, so those are the four arms of our, our work. So we encourage people to reach out, and we're really excited to connect with folks at the summit. And we always get um, folks wanting us to come out and, and do more trainings, which is really exciting. Yeah. So we're looking forward to that. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you so much for what you're doing. This is, I'm excited. I'm like, I love that you're out there making this difference for people. So. Well, I appreciate you and also this, the platform you're offering. I think having allies is really important in this work, as you know. Yeah. Um, it can feel isolating sometimes, but knowing that there are other folks out there doing the work is really um, helpful. Yeah, well, thank you so much. I can't wait to see you at Woodhall very soon. Thank you, us as well. We'll, we'll see you in, yeah, just over a month. Yeah, later. it's coming up yeah. fast. Yeah, it's coming up fast. <laughs> thank you very much. You're welcome.